Hello, welcome to How I Killed My Mother, the podcast about me and my mother who obviously died and super obviously by the title of my podcast, she passed on to the next dimension with my assistance. But we are about two or three episodes away from me telling you how I killed my mother. In this episode, I'm going to tell you about the lying years. Those years in my adult life when I lied to my mom about who I was and how those lies tragically put an end to the trust my mother and I had together. Lies that made my mom mad enough to kill. And before I tell you this week's tale, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, for no one but you will discover this podcast if you don't give my podcast a little help. And I appreciate that help. And feel free to reach out and say hi and tell me how you like this podcast. I am Mafia Hairdresser on most social media platforms, and I'm pretty active. To know more about me or to find out where you can get my books, Mafia Hairdresser, or the sequel, The Glow Stick Gods, go to MafiaHairdresser.com. And don't forget to check out my true crime podcast, John, David, and Goliath, as well as the serial podcast versions of The Mafia Hairdresser and The Glow Stick Gods on this same podcast stream. Just scroll backwards. You're listening to How I Killed My Mother, the fourth podcast in the Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles. Thank you for listening. Now on with my tale. I was raised in a sweet little town in California, which was part of the great sprawl of L.A. County. The town was called Glendora. Covina and Pasadena were neighbors. On three sides of my parents' property were the San Gabriel Mountains, and my childhood home sat overlooking the town where avocado trees once flourished and every teenager magically got a car at 16, because why not? Life was peachy, except that it was mostly avocados. Our community was made up of mostly non-diverse middle and upper middle class families. By ancestral foundership, the town had a Scottish background, and at my high school, we were known as the Glendora Tartans. A black Scotty dog with a plaid shoulder sash and kilts playing bagpipes was our mascot because nothing screams tough like Toto Tartan. Yeah, boring white, right? What you want to know is how I snagged a boyfriend when I was 17 years old and was that when I stopped using poor unsuspecting girls as beards in high school. So that's what's in this episode along with what happened the next two years plus after my family therapy session with my shrink. In last week's episode, I told you how my mom found the raunchy love letters my 17-year-old boyfriend wrote me, which forced me to momentarily come out to my parents. And this angered my mother, and she forced me to see a psychologist. The fact that mom was so blindsided to find out her number one son was gay was strange, because at the time, she had a gay brother, and that she, you know, knew me. I didn't have a gaydar myself, but if I knew me, I would think, oh yeah, gay gayerson. And besides, mom raised me to be who I was at the time, a self-reliant, mature boy who bravely declared that he was gay, after being brusquely forced out of the closet by mom. When the psychologist told my mom that I was healthy, that turned her into a momster who reneged on our prior agreement that she'd accept me being gay and my boyfriend Chuck. My momster unleashed her inner kraken, which began with torrents of accusations of who turned me gay, which included my boyfriend, the psychologist, and she even asked me if my gay uncle had ever touched me. My gay confession also unleashed my mom's dormant, inner, dutiful, devout Catholic crusader, and suddenly she felt she had to save my soul. Her word flame blaming, throwing, and righteous indignation at me being gay inspired divine clarification to what could only be a sickness or a remedial homosexual possession. And God must have told her that I could be cured with electrical exorcism because nothing turns you heterosexual more than 120 volts to the temples. To her credit, I'm sure mom was just trying to be the best mother she could have been, being the girl who grew up Catholic and with what she knew at the time. 
Mom once admitted to me that she thought I would have had a tough time or a rough life if I was to live as a gay man in a homophobic world. So why not just de-homophobe me so that I could stand a better chance at an easier, better, more homogeneous life? And I thought about that again years later. You know, after the threat of shock treatments was nothing but a reoccurring nightmare. I understood that my mom raised me and my brother as genteel and white as she could have. And that was because as a poor Hispanic girl in the family of 12 brothers and sisters who moved to a middle class white town in Northern California, she knew what hardships and prejudices were. She actually may have wanted a better life for me, and she thought that by making me straight and brain frying the gay out of me would have been best. But I also knew that she was angry that I lied to her. I should have told her I was gay. And she knew I lied about so many other things when I was a child. That pissed her off. I think she just wanted to break me down, and shock treatments seemed to be a good way to do it. As I told you before, to get out of the electroconvulsive therapy, which is called ECT, also known as shock treatments, I lied to my parents. I told them my sessions with the shrink had worked and that I was straight again. And they bought it for the next two years anyway. While still living under the roof, I pretended to be straight while I continued my relationship with my boyfriend. In those lying years, I built a house of cards that every member of my family unwittingly lived in. I made our family home a house of lies. And when that house finally tumbled and crumbled, it crushed us all. But before I tell you what happened during the lying years, during the fall of the house of Elsher, I will have to tell you how Chuck and I got together because it's adorable and horrible. Oh, as an aside, my last name given was Elsher, E-L-S-H-E-R-E. And somehow in the 90s when I was acting in, in Second City and blah, 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 I decided that was not Marquis. So I took my first and middle name, J-O-N hyphen David, and I put it together. So that's what I did. My dad's name was John G-O-H-N. My mom always called me John David. So it's just another way my mom branded me. I was John David and that's it. I wouldn't say do that, make a one name uh, person out of yourself because you need a last name for credit cards, everything. It's a mess. Anyway, let's move on. I was only a mere 16 going on 17 and halfway through my second to the last year of high school, I was also conceivably ascending to the eighth level of my pubertal yet superficial goal of getting on to an an imagined A-list at school. Doing great. The not obvious reasons to me that I dated girls was to be liked or visible or popular and noticed. I'm not sure if I knew why I needed so much validation. I'm still working on that, but I fear by the time I record the last episode of this podcast, I will. You know, self-growth is so fucking tedious and painful, don't you think? The apparent to me, reason that I put in all that work to be popular in high school was mostly because I was scared of telling my mom I was gay. And what better way to show her that I was straight than to be successful as a ladies' man? Bonus if I dated popularity-rated girls of an 8 or above on the John David scale of popular. At 16 going on 17, I had still been diddling with Kyle, my first boy relationship from junior high school. And then he broke it off with me because I was not going to stop social climbing, not to mention the fact that he had met a girl from another school that he liked. A girl, I would find out a few years later, that he loved very much and married. And yes, I'll update you on Kyle in a later episode. And by the way, He said that he liked what I said about him on Instagram just recently. I had no idea he was listening. Did did I use his real name? Fuck. Anyway, I'll say Kyle here. This is what happens when you don't have time to edit shit. Good for you, the listener, I suppose. So closeted, inauthentic me rejected love with a boy, Kyle, and continued to social climb and date girls. The only time I was out and proud was in the middle of the night on Saturday nights when I was getting my gay on dancing at Studio One, a club in Hollywood. I wasn't hooking up, just dancing, and I began to notice something missing that 
something was boy. I cannot remember how we became friends, but I was attracted to Chuck in our sophomore year and our junior year because he was exceptionally smart. Our school did not start at freshman, by the way. It started at sophomore. And I loved smart people because I didn't think that I was, but I did think I had street smarts and a sharp tongue that could easily slay when I wanted to impress. And I also had the wits to know that if I hung around smart people and nerds, I could copy their notes or get enough tutoring to pass my tests and grades. Always be nice to the nerds, I thought. One day they're going to employ me. Chuck was not only one of the smartest boys in high school, he was also like the ultimate popular member in the band because his dad was the former band director, which gave him cred. Plus, he was the best musician who knew the mechanics, philosophy, and science of music. Even the current band director would ask Chuck's advice on stuff I cannot even begin to try and remember. You know, stanzas, melodic arpeggios, I I don't know. Chuck liked pot. It calmed him down. Chuck also drank a lot. And the thing that intrigued me about his drinking or pot smoking is that he seemed completely sober. There was no change in his personality, no matter how much he drank or smoked. In fact, he seemed like he was more himself, which was inquisitive or sensitive and a great conversationalist because he always looked you in the eye and asked whomever he was talking to for them to elaborate on what they were saying. I liked Chuck when he drank or smoked because who doesn't love someone who listens to you and asks you to tell them more? Chuck's parents discovered his high IQ at an early age and they sent him every summer to summer school in Switzerland so he could learn another language, study music, or learn a new instrument. I think they made him go to Glendora High School, a public school, because his dad was the award-winning band director from many years prior to Chuck and I attending, so it was just maybe expected? I also think his parents thought public school would have been good for his social skills because he was so smart and a bit shy. He most certainly could have grown up in a bubble of, you know, with other brainy gifted children in a gifted school, but that's not what they chose for him. Lucky me, I say. But Chuck did well in Glendora High because some students admired him and he wasn't outwardly nerdy. Because we were pals, I knew his brainy side, yet insecure side, but to everyone else, he was affable and kind. And the fact that he had soulful brown eyes and long lashes with his swarthy Italian good looks, which included a strong masculine mustache, made him look like the opposite of someone, anyone whose head you'd want to smash into a hall locker. Even straight dudes man crushed on Chuck. Visually, the only tip-off that Chuck was a smart nerd was that he had thick bottle-bottom glasses because his eyesight wasn't great. My heart still flutters a bit when I remember lying next to Chuck when he had his glasses off and he looked at me. I regret that I did not cherish enough how much love Chuck gave me and showed me when he took off those thick glasses when our faces were so close and he could see me. The spark that ignited the beginning of the eight years that Chuck and I were together happened on a school night at our friend's house whose parents were away for a few days. There were only about five or six of us. Everyone was drinking and smoking pot. I was never great at pot. It mostly made me laugh too much and my mind wandered. Pot also made me say things that popped into my head. Things that should have stayed in the head yet escaped through my cotton mouth. They may have been clever and humorous words or musings, but over time, I had recognized that most people who partied with me didn't appreciate the smart things when I was high. At Chuck's insistence, I inhaled a whole bowl of Maui Wowie. I remember him saying it was my birthday, but I don't think it was. It was getting close, though, my 17th. I suppose I could just call him to see if he remembers the exact date. He would. In fact, I should. I want to ask him if I could use his real name in this podcast. Fuck. I think I already accidentally did. I mean, this podcast is kind of already a hit. 
I'm not afraid that Chuck would be bombarded by the press or anything. He wouldn't care. He's retiring soon anyway. The only negative I can think of is that Nick, Chuck's current husband, and the exact same person who became Chuck's husband the minute he and I broke up, I think Nick wouldn't love it if our romance was super public. I mean, everyone remembers Sonny and Cher, but does anyone actually remember Sonny's actual widow who took over his seat as mayor of Palm Springs after he died hitting a tree skiing? No. That's because the two people in the story of the romance in the media are always remembered. So Nick, if you're listening, dude, respect. I love you two together. Anyway, back to our story, my story. I ended up in our teenage host's bedroom on that pot night where I sat on her waterbed. To pass the time, I poked holes in the mattress with a safety pin. And then Chuck entered the room and shut the door behind him. And it went like this. (laughs) Uh, What are you doing in Tina's bedroom? Asked Chuck. The door shuts. Oh, um, why? I mumbled. Did you have sex with Tina on this bed? Ew. No. He said. Grody to the max. Oh, okay. It's sort of wet. And then I got off the bed to go back with Chuck to our little band group party in the living room. (laughs) Uh, Why is it wet? He asked. Never mind. Let's go. No. Wait said Chuck, blocking me from the door. Uh, You you know that me and Tina are just friends, right? Yeah, so? I I didn't do anything with her. I just wanted you to know that. Chuck, I really um, can't speak or obviously walk so well, so, dude, you know... Oh, okay. Um, let's just sit down. Sit? Oh, okay. But not on the bed, though. Let's sit on the floor, then. You're making me seasick watching you stand up anymore. That bed made me sloshy. And then I suppressed a giggle. I remember trying not to laugh. That was why I ended up poking holes in Tina's bedroom in the first place. I had told one of the girls at the party that she had closed-set eyes, which made her look dumb, and that was why she got hit on all the time. No one thought it was funny, though. So that made me laugh. Then I doubled down and pointed out that if guys knew how smart she really was, that she never would have gotten laid as much as she had. (laughs) It's kind of like Chuck when he takes off his glasses, I said. And then I laughed harder because what I said was very funny. Then a few of my friends said that I was being rude and that was very, very funny. So I laughed even harder. So I banished myself to the water bedroom. Chuck and I sat on the floor, cross-legged and facing each other. Chuck was my best friend, my bud, my bestie. Of course I thought it was odd and kind of funny not funny that we were sitting on the floor facing each other like that. But I was high and maybe it wasn't odd or funny at all. My pot brain was computing the best it could while simultaneously looking for the joke in the situation that I might say out loud at the most inappropriate time. So you're pretty wasted, said Chuck. And I was like, no doy. He'd seen me high before. Chuck had seen me so high that I forgot to pull up my pants. In fact, I had a whole conversation with him before falling on my face when I tried to walk with my pants around my ankles. I even laughed back then when that happened. I remember he did not laugh. Anyway. There is something I want to ask you. He said slowly, while reaching forward and suddenly grabbing both of my hands in both of his hands. And I said, oh, dude, you're clammy, wet. Uh, you want me to stop? He asked. What? No. Oh, I guess, you know, it could be me. You know, the moistness. I was just, um, and I looked over at the bed to see if there was water running out of the mattress. Your hands are a little wet, said Chuck, only just noticing. Uh, maybe I'm dying, I deflected, or or, or turning into a zombie. Uh, I, I need to ask you something, Chuck said. Chuck had to shake my hands and arms to make me focus on what he was saying. <laughs> yeah, what? I was startled. I wanted to, uh, what I wanted to say is, 
I mean... Dude, spit it out. I was either getting frustrated or bored. I want to give you something for your birthday. Wait, Chuck, my birthday isn't... I, I wanted to give it to you early. Oh, where is it? What? The present. It's not like that. Chuck took off his glasses, and then he leaned toward me and put his face closer to mine. It was fairly intense. We were just friends up to then. But those pretty eyes. Chuck. Uh, what? I am not uh, very comfortable. Oh, oh, funny. Um, yeah, don't make me laugh, Chuck. I'm a little high, and I'm not really sure what's happening here. John David, I want to... And he squeezed my hand. You're squishing my ouch. I want to suck your dick for your birthday. Oh, wow. On any other night, I would have said, hell yeah, but not, oh, wow. Heaven knows I was in a dry spell. And when Chuck asked me if he could suck my dick for my birthday, I instantaneously realized that he was hot. I'd not previously allowed myself to see that before, partly because I never thought for a second that he was gay. He was built more mannish and muscular, the opposite of 110-pound heroin chic me. And we had had countless sleepovers together, and we had spent so much time together, I don't think he ever gave me the slightest hint. Of course, I was probably always yapping on about my girlfriends to make sure that he thought I was straight, which might have been off-putting, I guess, even if he did like what he saw that time I fell over with my pants around my ankles. I didn't say hell yeah because I was too high, and yet I was lucid enough to know that I couldn't have physically functioned to have been in an amorous circumstance anyway. Moreover, I mistakenly thought Chuck would completely understand if I communicated to him that I'd rather discuss his offer at a later date, in which time we might pick up where we left off. That is to say that I'd love to accept his generous birthday prezi maybe tomorrow. But I was confident about my sexuality, and Chuck was not. And my ability to be empathetic, as well as read the room, was suppressed by the Maui Wowie. So when I asked Chuck if we could just put a pin in this, he took that as a flat-out rejection. In his mind, he had taken a significant risk by mistakenly thinking his best friend with a really high voice was gay, and it had just come out in the most embarrassing way. Now it had blown up in his face while blowing his cover. So when I asked Chuck if we could just put a pin in this, the synapses in my cloudy by cannabis brain were able to let me comprehend that Chuck was experiencing horror when I saw it in his face. But the pot brain also made the situation mildly ironic and extremely funny, funny, funny to me. I tried to think of something to say which would have reassured Chuck that I truly did want to be naked with him, but what came out instead was laughter. Sadly, most definitely, Chuck thought I was laughing at him. So he ran out the door and I didn't see him for the rest of the night. Chuck was not in the house when I went back to the party, so I didn't stay very much longer. I went home to my parents' house, where I probably passed my mother, who may have said something about my bloodshot eyes. I would have told her that it was because I was studying at a friend's house with bad lighting, and she would have believed me. Then I went to bed, where I thought about Chuck all night. The next day at school, Chuck was not there. I asked around, but none of our friends knew where he was. But I knew my best friend very well. I knew he thought I was blabbing to all of our friends that he was a big homo because if there was any gossip or scandal at school, I was usually the one to blab it. Not this time, though. I also knew Chuck wouldn't be at his own parents' house because school wasn't out yet, and he wouldn't have wanted his mom and dad to know that he had ditched. Since our friend's parents were still supposed to be out of town, I knew that Chuck would probably be at the same house we partied at the night before. So I ditched school about halfway through the day, and I drove to our friend's house, where I walked in through the unlocked door and into our friend's bedroom, where I saw Chuck lying on the waterbed reading a book. His favorite activity, by the way. 
The bed was dry, which made me wonder if I had only imagined that I punctured the mattress with the safety pin the night before. (sighs) But that didn't matter. What mattered is that I was pretty sure that Chuck had asked me if he could suck my dick the night before. Um, 87% sure. If Chuck could have run away, he would have, but he couldn't. I was blocking the door. But Chuck did stand up, and I grabbed him, and I kissed him. And he began to cry. But he grabbed me back. I wish I could remember the words we spoke, but I do remember the release of his worry and his fear that I had rejected him. Chuck held on to me in a hug, and it was so tight, and I felt his tears run down both of our faces. I liked his scratchy stubble. We had not seen each other in less than a day, but in those hours, it must have seemed like his world was crashing down on him. His best friend was surely angry or appalled or horrifyingly entertained by being hit on by him and by asking to suck his dick as an inappropriate birthday present. And that scene was surely being repeated at school, the school he attended by that gossipy best friend. These are the kinds of things that crush kids or make them do terrible things. Thankfully, Chuck just hit out, albeit probably in mental agony and alone at our friend's parents' house. I could tell that Chuck had been in our friend's parents' liquor cabinet. He had alcohol on his breath. And I was kind of thankful for that because I think he was so stunned to see me that he acted on instinct, and that was to hold me and kiss me back. And that showed me that he really liked me. When I asked him to go with me for a drive to Glendore Mountain Road, he was too buzzed to understand why at first. But he got it soon enough. When I put the back seat flat and opened up the trunk divider, I told Chuck to lay down with me. And we made love to each other. I believe I would have fallen in love with Chuck anyway. Maybe even if he had never come on to me that first night. Maybe it would have been years later, or maybe in our senior year, after another year of me pretending to date and bed girls. Maybe I would have hit on him first, if I had caught the slightest inclination that he was gay or bi. But because he hit on me, and then I had those hours in bed thinking how I was going to handle things between us, while realizing what he must have been going through, cracked open my heart. I had all night and morning and half a day of school to also think about what it would be like to have him in bed and in my life as my boyfriend. I liked the thought of that. So when we made love in my car that day on GMR, I fell in love with him, his smell, his body, his kind soul. I loved Chuck so much, and that love and our relationship has affected every relationship I have had since we broke up eight years later. And that is how Chuck and I became boyfriends, and it was the first big life-changing milestone I experienced in my life. The second life-changing milestone in my life after falling in love with Chuck was when my mom ferreted in my sock drawer and found those love letters Chuck had written to me in our junior year of high school, our most sexual years together. I was 17 and in love, so yeah, we had a lot of sex, and Chuck wrote it all down. And as you've heard, for the fourth time, Mom flipped out about those letters. She made me go to a psychologist and forbade me to see Chuck during that time. And I agreed to that if she agreed that if the psychologist said I was mentally healthy, I would be able to see Chuck again. And when the shrink said I was okay, Mom lied and said that she was going to pursue shock treatments to turn me straight. I then convinced her that the psychologist appointment made me straight. And so began the two and a half years that I not only went back into the closet for my mother, I became the biggest liar to my mother. In those years that were sponsored by the letter L for lies, I reasoned that my mom deserved to be lied to because she had lied to me. She said she would accept me for being gay and my relationship with Chuck, and she never intended to do that. So I felt, okay, no, righteous enough to lie to her and my dad. My dad, because I felt he should have stood up for me against my mom. The lying years put me in a different categorical level of lies. This was not the same thing as being in the closet because I feared telling my mom I was gay. Some people have to stay in the closet until they're 18 because they don't know what their parents might do to them, like mine, who had proposed to give me shock treatments. The lying years had me living a double life purposely and willfully to make my parents believe that I was a person whom I was not. 
I thought I was a resounding 10 level masterful liar in the lying years. The summer before our senior year in high school, Chuck and I attended a cheerleading camp with four of our friends. We trained to be rifle twirlers for our high school band. (sighs) And it was like a honeymoon for Chuck and me. The other two guys and two girls on our team were straight and we were not really out to them. But there were a few gay cheerleaders we got to know at camp, and they validated and admired our relationship. My mom designed and sewed our rifle team's uniforms that year. She would have strangled Chuck with his poofy pirate shirt and his royal Stuart plaid sash if she had known that we were still sleeping together as a couple. After our senior year, Chuck enrolled at Long Beach State and at first lived in the dorms, but then he got his first apartment as soon as he could with his paying job as a waiter at a restaurant called Northwoods Inn. He got the apartment just so when I visited him from only 40 miles away, I could spend the nights with him. After I graduated from high school, I attended Mount San Antonio College to be an airline pilot. Alas, before the end of the first year, I realized that I would rather be a flight attendant mingling and serving drinks to the passengers than a person stuck in a little cockpit hours upon end. Instead of taking my finals at the end of my second semester, I just quit and came home and told my parents I wasn't into it. Unbeknownst to my parents, school or anything else didn't matter as much to me as saving up money to move in with Chuck sometime in the unforeseeable future. I don't remember if Chuck and I talked much about the when we would live together. I may have just assumed it and he went along with it. All we definitely knew was that up until that time, we had found it easy to keep not just my parents in the dark regarding our relationship, but his parents as well. And that was preferable because his parents were definitely paying for his college. Surprisingly, mom and dad were not supportive in my decision to quit school. I thought, after all, I was paying for my own college. At that time, Dad's two service stations, uh, the cash flow had been in sort of a stall and a recoup period since the gas crunch of the 70s. Not to mention the dealerships were beginning to absorb a lot of the auto repair business. But I was working at his two gas stations and I was getting a paycheck. So it wasn't like I didn't have a job. Why were my parents blowing a gasket over me quitting? My parents not only did not like the fact that I quit school and had decided that I was not going to be an airline pilot, they were particularly pissy that I had just walked away from the credits of a second semester of college. My mom accused me of just being too lazy to put myself through finals. On that point, she was very correct. I was too lazy to take the finals. I hadn't really studied for them. But none of that mattered because what was done was done, and they had already discussed what would be done if any of their sons decided not to go to college. They informed me that I had better choose what I wanted to do with my life immediately. Otherwise, they were going to make me move out or pay rent, or they wanted me to commit to working with my dad at his service stations for the rest of my life. At first, I was a little insulted and pissed off myself. I was 18 going on 19 then. I was an adult. And had I not been through enough with their threats already... But then I realized that I had no wiggle room. I had nowhere to go. And I wanted to keep all my paycheck. And them were the rules if I wanted to keep living there. But but, 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 but what should I do with my life? I began to ponder. And it all came to me quite quickly. I remember hanging out with my friend Cindy Ardia and her much older brother, Bernie, who was a Hollywood hairdresser. Whenever he saw me, he always said, girl, you a hairdresser. And I had always thought he was just saying that I was gay, you know, like sisters, you know, chiding me. But I began to realize that he saw something in me, not just the gay part. And since I had been cutting my dude co-worker's hair at my dad's gas station, not to mention a lot of my friend's hair, which started out in the band room in high school, it occurred to me that I just might try beauty school. What cinched that idea for me was that my parents did not like that idea when I brought it up. Boy, did that piss my parents off. They thought being a hairdresser was not going to ever amount to a lot of money or success. And shortly after I enrolled and began beauty school, the third big milestone happened in my life. On one Sunday morning, my parents found Chuck in my bedroom. He had snuck into the house the night before when they were still asleep. 
And the next morning, he was waiting for them to leave so that I could make us both breakfast in their own dining room. We had spent two years of thinking we were so good and sneaky at being together. Many times he would sleep over at my parents' house right under my parents' noses. Only this time, we got caught. Dun, 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 dun. I was sitting in the dining room, waiting for my parents to go to the Azusa swap meet with my little brother, who was 14 years old at the time. But before they left, mom decided to empty the trash, and she had to pass outside my bedroom on her way to the trash cans. Johnny! Johnny! Mom screamed for my dad as she dropped the bag of trash. When mom walked by the glass door to my bedroom, the same door that Chuck or I could come and go in the middle of any given night, mom saw Chuck. He was sitting, fully clothed, reading a People magazine at the foot of my bed. Get the shotgun! My mom yelled. As I sat on one of the bar stools that faced the kitchen, I watched my mom exit the kitchen with the trash. But I didn't think much of it. After she emptied the trash, she would leave. And when she yelled for my dad to get the shotgun, I immediately thought there might be a coyote or a rabbit or a mountain lion or a rabid squirrel or raccoon in the backyard or possibly a rattlesnake sitting on the backyard lawn sunning itself. Needless to say, I didn't think mom was yelling for dad to get his shotgun because there was an intruder. The same intruder whom she had just rediscovered was still my boyfriend since the moment I declared and promised to her that I was straight that day after our last psychology appointment over two years ago. But mom was yelling for dad to get the shotgun because she had accidentally uncovered that I had lied to her big time. So she was fired up enough to kill an intruder who was my boyfriend, a person she probably always wanted dead. Before I thought to even get up off of my bar stool in the kitchen, dad did run and get the shotgun because of my mom's tone and request. We lived in a canyon. There were a lot of reasons, some I have mentioned, to have guns handy. My dad was bearing arms and out the back door in no time. And my brother, ever the rattlesnake slayer and teen curious, also ran out the door. I was the last person to reluctantly get off my bar stool to see what mom was yelling at. I was just annoying that whatever was in the backyard was going to make my family stay longer at their very own house when I just wanted them to leave so I could begin my day cooking breakfast for my boyfriend. When the wooden framed screened door slammed shut behind me after I came out to the backyard, I saw my mom pointing at Chuck, who was standing about four feet from her. He was terrified and he was frozen. My brother was confused and my dad stood there holding the shotgun. Thankfully, the gun barrel was not aimed at Chuck. Shoot him! Mom screamed. Shoot him! He is a trespasser and we have every right to shoot trespassers on our property. My dad had no intention of shooting Chuck or anyone ever. In fact, my dad had sussed up the entire situation pretty well. I had lied for two and above years and now we were here and he had had enough of being lied to by me. And whatever could have been stirred up once again between me and my mother in the here and now, he was also fed up with. Son, Dad said, you have a decision to make. You can make Chuck go home and you can stay here or you can go with him. Mom started to yell and my dad made her shut up without even raising his voice. His steely calm surprised her and me. Finally, my dad was standing up to my mom, but not in the way I would have liked. I would have liked for him to tell her right then and there that it was time for mom to accept me and Chuck. But that's not what my dad said. That was not on the table. I understood clearly what my options were. I could stay and live under their roof, and I would have to quit seeing Chuck for real this time which would mean they would monitor every second I was not in their presence. Or I could leave a Chuck, move out. Dad knew exactly what I would do. And to his credit, Dad did the best thing for me and my mom. I was invited to man up and quit lying and make my way in the world. Well, fuck them, I thought. I had a car, I had some money, and I had a job. I could get an apartment by myself. Of course, I chose Chuck. No, no, 
said my mother as I began to go inside my bedroom door to get my car keys and some clothes. The car is under our name. It's our car. You walk out of here with your filthy little fag boyfriend. You walk out with the clothes on your back. She didn't say fag, I'm sure of it. But what she said was certainly derogatory and probably alluded that Chuck was a devil or devil spawn or evil. You get the picture. I looked at my dad to see if he would help me out. He just nodded. Another firm stance. Good for you, dad. And fuck you, dad. So I walked out of my parents' backyard with Chuck. I had less than $200 in my pocket and my driver's license. That was it. My brother suffered greatly because he had not one little idea of what was happening between my mom and me in prior years. When I was going to the shrink, she made him keep his distance from me. And when I left, she forbade me from seeing him for a while. And he didn't forgive her for that for a long time. And I think he thought that I was like my mom, which I was, or had been trying to be. So that also affected our relationship a bit, I think, in the future. So I walked away from my birth family and the house that I grew up in to be with my boyfriend. Poor Chuck. He didn't get shot by a shotgun, but he practically got cornered into a shotgun wedding. In this roller coaster of self discovery, betrayal, and suburban melodrama, I learned that life is too complicated for simple truths. And sometimes the best thing you can do is write it out, laugh it off, and brace for the next week's episode when I tell you about how my mom got what she wished for in reference to seeing me suffer because I had become a parent. I'll also tell you about the Mafia hairdresser days, which came about because of my empty nest syndrome. All of that coming up in the next episode next week in How I Killed My Mother. Thanks for listening. Share, like, subscribe, comment, 